Henry Akeley disappeared from his home on the edge of Rendlesham Forest in Suffolk somewhere around the end of June 2019. They come every night down. I've buried five dogs so far. I've made more recordings. I've also picked them up on my radio set. The police don't believe me. Now, please, I just need you to get in touch. What we uncovered, what we're still uncovering, is a mystery that has sent us deep into England's past. To an area steeped in witchcraft, the occult, secret government operations. Now we have multiple sites of five lights with a similar shape property. And something that might indeed be altogether otherworldly. This is The Whisperer in Darkness. Coming soon on BBC Sounds. Kelly and Freddie here with Julian Simpson, the writer director of BBC Radio's The Whisperer in the Darkness. Hi, Julian. Thanks for doing this. Hi. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, this is a. Uh, now I listened to the first season. I, if you are listening to our podcast and you've never heard the case of Charles Dexter Ward that you guys released, um, that was also just in 2019, wasn't it? That was uh, pretty much this time last year, yeah. Yeah. So- well, actually, yeah, it was like, I can't remember now. I think it was, yeah, this time last year or the beginning of the year. Yeah. Um, so that was a retelling of the, you know, the classic uh, Lovecraft novel. But you took it in a really interesting direction by kind of mashing it up with the format of Serial, the the really yeah. super popular, what put podcasts on the map, the investigative journalism uh, story Serial, which was all, you know, factual. But you, you took this in such a great way and blended some reality with this the Lovecraft mythos and just made this really super creepy world uh, for your... Thank you. Yeah, oh, yeah <laughs> it's fantastic. And uh, it's the mystery machine, right? Is the framing show... That was the framing show for the first series, and it kind of, in our minds, it still is, but there is uh, legal issues around using that <laughs> right. as, oh. a, as, a, as a phrase. So, um, yeah, we kind of dropped it for the second series, um, and just kind of, people still refer to it as that, but it was Mystery Machine in the first series when we thought we were just going to be a UK show, and then it kind of went wide, and it was like, oh, okay, this is probably going to be a problem, so we should turn it down. Get a call from Scooby Doo. Hannah Barbera is coming <laughs> exactly. after you. <laughs> so, um, in the first season, you, you set up almost a, a a grand conspiracy that your uh, your podcast hosts have uncovered, and then mm-hmm. in Whisper in the Darkness, you you've brought it back because uh, case of Charles Dexter Ward takes place in Providence, Rhode Island, right? So yeah. And yeah, now, yeah. You, now you've brought it home to England. And uh, mm-hmm. with the whisper in the darkness, can you kind of tell us just, uh, I guess, the yeah, elevator it's, uh, pitch? It's, it's uh, well, there was no elevator pitch for this. <laughs> There's no elevator long enough for this pitch. Um, it was, uh, first of all, it wasn't intentional, actually. Charles Dexter Ward was, as you say, it was serial meets Lovecraft. And it was intended to be kind of a one-off series. Um, and writing it i kind of fell in love with the characters and then recording it even more and then people really responded to it so uh we went for a second series and the second series i was originally going to do the shadow over innsmouth oh my favorite uh yeah and then i kind of was like okay i read whisper in darkness and i knew about uh by the time we'd done Charles Dexter Ward, we knew what the mix was. I knew that it was Lovecraft plus, uh, you know, existing occult law and rumors and conspiracy theories and that kind of thing. So I was like, okay, that's the that's the recipe book here. So how do we now uh, do another version, another story? And I knew about the Rendlesham Forest incident, which is like the British Roswell. So I was like, okay, it's a forest something landed in 1980 supposedly a bunch of u.s air force guys saw something and this could be where henry a clears and these could be the things that are knocking on his door and it starts to make sense i had absolutely no intention of tying it back into charles dexter ward at that point i it was only when i started writing and i literally had the characters in the akeley house in episode one of the whisper in darkness and i was like i I've cast so much doubt on this character of Henry Akeley as to whether he's even sane, you know, that he he could just be making this up and there may be nothing to investigate here. What is the hook 
for our investigators because in the first series of Charles Dexter Ward you've got a locked room mystery you've got a guy in a mental asylum vanishes in the middle of the night and we also had his doctor which is not in the original story Dr Willett has come to England and has murdered somebody and that those that confluence of events makes some sense as an investigator you go there's something to dig into here but with henry akeley it was just like mad old guy in the woods says something is attacking him there's no reason to believe him there's no story here and it was only when i was kind of tackling that problem that i was like okay there's a photograph on the wall and it's a photograph of amelia fanner who was a character in charles dexter ward and i was like oh at that point i was like oh shit i've i've just I'm building a world now. I've got, I'm pulling all this stuff in from season one, all this kind of, you know, un, un, uh, untied up stuff from season one. And so it kind of just built and built and built from there. Um, and now we're going to go into season three with, you know, both of those things behind us and a whole bunch of more stuff and a, a genuine desire to tie it up. But it's all going to turn into one big story, I think. That's excellent. I yeah, all the elements are blended so beautifully um, with, like you said, the the real folklore and 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 uh, it, it makes such a great sort of analogy to Lovecraft's New England, like where where you have the setting and using like real bits of folklore, like the old Shook, and it it yeah. really creates such an immersive um, experience, and it just it feels like Lovecraft without having to be like uh, a carbon copy, you know, it's, I, I think you've really kind of done what a lot of other people struggle with is to make it relevant and, um, but still maintain that same creepy feel that same conspiracy feel. So uh, it, it's, it's, uh, I think, I think there's a, I think there's a, there's a weird kind of kismet to that though, because when I started looking at Rendlesham, one of the first things I did, I started reading about the, the UFO incident, but I also got an ordnance survey map of the area up on my wall. And I grew up about, uh, I don't know, maybe 30 miles from there, 40 miles from there. Um, and, uh, but in England, that's a long way. And you, I've never been there. I'd never been there. I'd never been to that part of the world at all. And I get this ordnance survey map and I put it up on the wall just so I can start to figure out where places are. And just up from Rendlesham on the map is Dunwich. And I'm like, wait, Dunwich? <laughs> as in as in the Dunwich horror? What? And I start looking and I start looking at the stories that were written around Suffolk. M.R. James's ghost stories were mm -hmm. written. A lot of them were set there. And uh, Arthur Macon referenced um, stuff there as well. And then I'm starting to look at Lovecraft's essays on other horror writers. And I'm going, oh, he's used Dunwich for his fictional New England because of this Dunwich, because it's got, it comes up in other people's stories that he was reading at the time. So it's like it's like his uh, Lovecraft's kind of Arkham area in New England is kind of modeled on that area of England. So I was like, OK, we have a connection that I wasn't even aware of. And we've just kind of lucked into it. And now we can use that. And then even more so when you start looking at for an area that's not directly on the coast. Um you start to get quite a lot of uh, mermaid myths around there. And I was like, this is like the shadow over Innsmouth oh, as yeah. well now. Is, you know, so we've got weird mer people coming out of the sea and stuff. I'm like, this is all Lovecraft, but he, and he may have known this folklore. I don't know. And some of the people he was reading referenced it, but there was a, more of a connection than I was aware of. Definitely. It's going to be kind of surreal too, because you know, Lovecraft was an Anglophile and like, to start with what you, like you're saying, like you think it might be this American literature, but really he is drawing on things from your home country and to kind yeah, of bring up, does that bring like any sense of like, and I'm a total skeptic. So I really appreciate the Kennedy character. <laughs> um, like, you know, I'm, I'm, a, you know, I, I really need to see some real hard evidence of something to believe yeah, it. Yeah. But there's always those things when you keep digging down to the the root of it where you start to kind of question whether maybe there is some truth at the root of all you start this connecting stuff. the dots with coincidences and and uh, yeah i mean i think that there's uh, what i found and this is not a mystical experience this is just like a creative experience but 
the number of times writing these two seasons where stuff has linked together in ways I wasn't expecting it to. So, you know, I was listening to a, an episode of the Unexplained podcast that Richard McLean Smith does, and he was talking about Jack Parsons. And there was a little extra bit on the end of that they, where they talked about Jack Parsons seeing strange cylindrical objects in the sky. And I was like, oh, my God, OK, Parsons is talking about seeing UFOs. And this directly ties into what we're talking about. And so we can have our, our uh, academic character, Ellen the Peck, refer to Parsons and Parsons' uh, girlfriend as, you know, UFO experts. And, and they tied in and she says, you know, these people never met an unsolved mystery. They couldn't tie into their mythology. So it's like, you know, you people are kind of gathering it up and pushing it all together. The weirdest thing that happened, though, was uh, I was idly trawling through the London Library where website they have a archive of the times newspaper going back to like the 1700s and um i was literally just stuck i was writing like episode five or something and i was stuck and i went on there and i was just noodling around and i typed in the word tillinghast into their search engine i was like i wanted this made-up character that i have who's kind of the bad guy in this first season can we tie him to anything i knew there was a tillinghast in providence rhode island you know early on one of the guys who kind of founded that city so i was kind of like well is there anything else and I type in and I get this Times article, which which we had Hayward read out, uh, but I, there's no reason for anyone to realize it was real. Uh, this Times article about an accident in Niagara Falls in 1869, where a guy called Tillinghast, who's probably the Tillinghast from, well, he said, it, they say Tillinghast from Providence, Rhode Island, is probably the guy, um, uh, is in a carriage accident. The carriage went over the edge of, uh, I guess not the falls, but, you know, nearby and went down a cliff. And uh, most of the people in it were killed. And the survivors were this guy Tillinghast and a Mrs. Fisher. And I was like, you're kidding. <laughs> that is weird. And uh, that, that newspaper article was what made me literally, I... I read that newspaper article. I was like, I don't quite know where this fits yet. But the next thing I typed was don't trust Kennedy Fisher and gave it, gave it to the mystery woman to say, and I was like, okay, we're not trusting her now. We're now going to go. Okay. This is not what it seems. Um, so yeah, weird things happen. I don't, I'm as skeptical as you guys are about all of this stuff, but folklore is really interesting because as, uh, I think the Wilmoth character in the show says at one time, certainly Eleanor Peck says it a lot. Um, it explains some stuff to people. You know, these stories that, you know, a rabid dog attacks some people in a church and that becomes the dog that's possessed by the devil and suddenly this dog that's possessed by the devil is everywhere. Um, but probably the root of the story was something real. Right. Um, and, and it just kind of grows in the telling, you know. So, and that's great for us. Now, your, your background is in, like, television and film, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, I saw that you had directed some uh, some really great episodes of the new Doctor Who series with uh, Matt Smith. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it, did you find like having that access through that experience? Did that give you... Because your cast is out of this world. They're fantastic. The cast, we're really lucky. And I think um, I've done a bunch of radio plays for Radio 4 in the past. So uh, I've kind of been gathering like a little radio rep company as I go. Um, and I have a, a superstition that I just don't do audio without Nicola Walker, who plays Eleanor Peck in the show. I just I won't touch. I won't. I won't get near a microphone unless she's there. Um, but um, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's it's easier. It's interesting. The especially in the fiction podcast space, which is such a new space to be in, and there's so few people doing stuff in that space at the moment, that trying to get actors that you don't know to come and do it and going through their agents and having to do deals where you're like, there's no money. And yeah, no, I can't really explain what this is. And, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's hard. Um, whereas my guys, I can just go, hey, we're doing another one. And they're like, great, when? That's fantastic. Um, so, you know, it's much easier. Um and they're all really good and really versatile, and I write for them now. So, you know, Eleanor Peck was written for Nicola Walker, and uh, Hayward was written for Barney, and, and Kendi Fisher was written for Jana. It's, you know, you kind of know what people can do. And each time you bring new people in and you find them, and when they work out, which they really have on these two seasons, uh, you know, you bring them back. So there was a guy uh, in season two, uh, a character called Ben, uh, played by Ben Crow, who's the guy in the kind of uh, gentleman's club who Hayward goes to see and knows all about military stuff and things. Um, 
he was like a, a bit part player in the first series. He does a few voices here and there. And we just really liked working with him. So I was like, okay, I'll write, write something for him, give him a proper part with a proper name and everything. So, you know, it's really fun to kind of build it like that. Yeah, you had some people that, um, there, I always have certain actors I, I just latch on to, like Adam Godley, who you had in season one, who, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's so great. He, he was, was on great. that series Lodge 49 on EMC, which I don't know. If I he, don't know that show. It is, I know him from, obviously from England, but his American stuff for me was like Breaking Bad and stuff. Oh, yes. I knew. Yeah. He, he, I mean, these are people who always seem to pick the best projects to be involved with like like lodge 49 is yeah. brilliant it's two seasons it got canceled unfortunately but it's also a show about these esoteric themes and uh it's just okay. interesting to see the that he was in this as well but um that alan armstrong great character actor and you know i was uh-huh. obviously as a, a child of the 80s i was like crawl <laughs> you know that was my big excitement there <laughs> <laughs> And uh, what did I see? Oh, and he's in uh, he's in some weird films. He's in White Hunter Black Heart, the Clint Eastwood movie. Yes, um, yeah. And he's, in, he's in the Duelists, Ridley Scott's first film. Alan's in that. Yeah, just a un- unbelievable pedigree. And then uh, Samuel uh, Barnett is it Samuel Barnell? Is that right? Who uh, played, yeah, uh, who played Dirk Gently, which is another did, yeah. that that's just like um, some of my favorite stuff so t- it was really thrilling when i was like i think i recognize that voice and then to check the cast list and to see these great the, i love when that happens when yes. you recognize a voice right yeah yeah just fantastic like it, it it elevates the experience uh because again it speaks to the quality of what you're doing that you would attract the this caliber of performance um i hope it. so yeah but I also think it's kind of a chicken and egg situation because I don't know if the quality of what we were doing would be that high if we were, didn't have that kind of cast in it. So, you know, like I think the scripts are good, but, you know, you could give that to some bad actors and really fuck it up. So, you know, it's yeah. nice that we have, you know, it's it, it's a symbiosis, really. Yeah, I could listen to, uh, I don't know who the actor is that plays the uh, Vicar Wilmarth, but uh, I could listen to that guy talk all day long. Uh, he, so he, Wilmarth is the same. I'm going to break, I'm going to break a whole bunch of uh, four. <laughs> stuff here now wilmarth is dr willett oh um so yeah dr willett in the first and then he appears being insanely crazy in a kind of david lynch type scene in in season two as well that's the same actor mark basley yeah cool (laughs) yeah i I just love his voice his delivery like uh especially when he's talking about folklore and 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 just kind of yeah he's great it's very eerie yeah um yeah so did you get a lot of creative feedback like as far as like was it performed as written i guess is what i'm trying to say or or um yeah yeah, mostly it is i've got um uh john is american so she will occasionally go yeah we don't say that and you know (laughs) and change things um and uh yeah actually it is and the reason for that is because no one has to learn lines so it's just easier to show up and read the fucking thing and not think. <laughs> um, when people have to learn it, they start really thinking about it. And um, and that can be good. And it can also be they can go down the wrong track sometimes and you have to kind of b- bring them back and they get, they get all like, my character wouldn't really do this. And you're like, that doesn't really happen with radio. So, but, you know, this my character wouldn't do this thing is kind of annoying because you're like, well, they do do it. you got to figure that out. Um, and... Uh, so yeah, it's. I mean, creatively, this show is uh, insanely free. The BBC pay for it, but they don't read scripts in advance, and they don't listen to the show before it goes out. That is fantastic. So yeah. <laughs> there is like literally no. It's my me, my producer Karen Rose, who's been my radio, been producing the radio shows I've done and then the podcasts I've done uh, ever since I've been doing audio. Um, so. I write the script. She looks at them and kind of goes, mm, yeah, that that's not so good. And, uh, and then, you know, kind of feeds back and that's the script. That's the scripting process. We then cast the actors, go and record it in a week, but we do it all on location. So it's, it's like a, it's just a much better kind of more real experience. There's a lot of sound on there that you wouldn't think to add if you were just sitting in a studio. Um, and, uh, and then we edit it, we put the music, we do whatever, everything we want to do with it. And no one is looking over our shoulder at any point, which is great. Yeah, I love, I didn't realize that this was recorded yeah, on occasion. Because there were a lot of great moments, like the sound of certain birds. Like you kind of get the vibe that maybe somebody has a bird cage or whatever. And it 
adds yeah, so yeah. much atmosphere. Yo, the atmosphere is so, it, it, it really, like I said, it's just so immersive and, and you just really start to feel, you know, when you're in Akeley's house, you, you feel a little claustrophobic. It's just really, uh, uh, you guys do a great job. When it's you, fun as well. Cause like when the, when they go across the road from the studio, when Haywood and Kennedy sometimes go to the cafe across the road, the coffee shop across the road, um, that is actually a coffee shop and it's got real customers in it and real people behind the counter. And we don't, if it was a movie or a TV show, you'd hire it out and you'd empty it and you'd put extras in there and they'd all be quiet and blah, blah, blah. We don't, we literally go in there and buy a cup of coffee and sit in the corner and record them. So whatever's happening in the background is real. Anything you can hear people talking, if it gets loud, they, these guys just have to raise their voice. Um, and it makes it so much more real than if you were recording it, you know, in a fake location. I don't know why it's never occurred to me. Like, uh, as an audio engineer to like take go out in the field to do drama like well i think you think of it as a perfection you know you're like yeah. I, I need to be able to control the space you know uh so i, I get yeah but the, and you do you do end up going i mean there's so many times when we are in the forest especially and it's like oh there's a plane oh there's a plane oh there's someone walking their dog you know it's all of that stuff you have to stop for but on the flip side of that when you get accidental noise that you would never think to add it's amazing yeah, I just had like some sort of weird chime in the background from some device. So uh, people will think I added that in post <laughs> so they would believe we're in a studio. <laughs> but uh, yeah, episode six of season two, I think is my favorite. Um, Which one's episode six? You deliver a lot of exposition about uh, Nalar Totep or however it's pronounced. Oh, this is Stalin the Pax Big. Uh, Nia, Nia, I don't know. What was really funny is I have no idea how you're meant to pronounce that. And <laughs> so when we were sitting there recording it, Nicola Walker was like, is it Nia Lothotep or is it Nia Lothotep? And I was like, I don't know. And she was <laughs> like, okay. Oh, okay, I'll just try. So she did it. And then someone else said it a different way. And then on Twitter, when it came out, someone went, oh, well done for getting both pronunciations of Nia Lothotep on there. You're, real, you're a real Lovecraft expert. Uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, no I, one knows how to say that word. Right. And that's something like, as we, you know, we talked about how we played the tabletop game, Chaosium's Call of Cthulhu as, as teenagers and everything. <laughs> and um, I remember at 15, you kind well, one, you kind of buy into maybe this is real because back this is before the internet and we would absolutely you can't fact check it yeah you can't and you'd go to the bookstore and suddenly there's a copy of the necronomicon there and you're yeah. like wait a yeah. minute <laughs> uh, i spent the longest time assuming that was a real book that he'd like co-opted for his stories yeah i knew a lot of people in high school who thought uh, the necronomicon was real yeah and it was so much fun yeah. to have that level of wonder like you're like that that makes it so magical but when uh and part of it talking about the pronunciations that was always in because we didn't have any references on how to pronounce these things yeah, everybody had their own way of saying i always said in our left yeah. tap yeah and you know but there's it's that's what's one of the great things you can say however you want but i like that it kind of ties into your story when um you know it's not i don't think it's much of a spoiler to say as the the settlers found these materials and they began to translate them that they didn't know what they were doing. And I, yeah. li I like the multiple pronunciations. It, it adds to the danger of the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. And the, also the fact that he is meant to be this kind of arch trickster and he goes under a bunch of different names. Of course, his name is pronounced differently depending on who's saying it. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's so it's just so eerie. And he's my favorite of all of the like great old ones uh, because yeah. because of the tricks or stuff. And mainly because I think he turned up a lot in the supplements that they wrote for that. Oh, game. for sure. Yeah. Uh, in particular, I remember yeah, because, yeah. because I've, I discovered this. You can use him for anything because what he isn't is a giant, you know, island sized thing covered in tentacles. Exactly. <laughs> so he can, can be a dude go, have to complain. This guy, this is fine. He can just turn up and possess people. It's great. There are. Um, um, I was going to ask yeah. you, though, you said when you played the game, do you remember there was a, an adventure supplement they had written about a, a jazz musician who was kind of like a um, almost like a Louis Armstrong type character that had made a deal with Neil Arthotep to to um, to become kind of a crossroads situation. Right. almost like the Robert Johnson story. Don't know that. It's a great adventure. Actually, I, it would just make a great short story. But um, yeah, the, and, but it's written as an adventure where he whenever he plays this trumpet the dead start to come back to life, like in the cemeteries and whatever town he's in. And it was just yeah. so eerie. Um, 
and it all comes back to this this character of this this great old one uh, who is fooling everybody. It's like it is that classic deal with the devil type of story. Yeah. Do you know what's weird about what you just said? There's a Legends of Tomorrow episode with that plot. Really, I there have- is a Legends of Tomorrow episode where a kid gets uh, it's Elvis. Elvis gets <laughs> buys a guitar in a thrift store, and when he plays it, the dead come back to life. That is that's crazy. Well, I think that really happened, though. That, re- that really yeah, did. I think, yeah, that, that, I, think, yeah. I think that's factual. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, like I said earlier, your backgrounds in you know TV and film. Like when you started writing this, was it always intended to be a radio drama? Yeah, absolutely. It was. It was. Uh, uh, I love doing radio because. Uh, the world built well i love doing it because you can do anything you want with audio and it's uh, nothing is more expensive than anything else really if we want to set a story on mars that it costs the same as setting it in la you know it's 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 just sound um so i like the freedom that it gives i've done a bunch of radio plays and i was starting to want to knit some of those ideas together a little bit uh which you'd have to go it's like a deep dive but there's Every radio play I've ever produced is referenced in season two of uh, in in the Whisper and Darkness season two of the Mystery Machine. Uh, every uh, everything I've ever done, the Pleasant Green stuff, the Blake House stuff, that is all from stuff I've done before. Um, and uh, I wanted it to be audio because for two reasons actually. A, I think horror and uh, and this is probably maybe the wrong podcast to say this on, but. I think that ghost stories and horror generally work best in sound only. Oh, no, uh, agreed. We were just talking about that, especially yeah. with Lovecraft, that it, it's yeah. so much better to do this way because you're just, it's all in your imagination. So you, you get exactly. to decide. Do you, but you have it. There's also this amazing relationship with the audience because when you're watching something on Netflix, you're just kind of watching it and you may be into it and you may not, and you may be looking at your phone or whatever. If you've bought into the first couple of minutes of an audio drama, then you're there and you're leaning in and you're doing like 30, 40 percent of the work for me because you're making the images in your mind based on the sounds and the stuff we're describing. So it's much, you know, it's a much more of a coming together. It's a much less of a passive experience as an audience. I kind of did like I had like this great almost trance moment listening to episode six, the one I was talking about earlier, mm-hmm. where she is just laying out all that. My imagination just started firing off like crazy. And um, yeah, it was it was chilling. Like and I had to, you know, I, I, I did. Unfortunately, I had to kind of multitask because um, of just time crunch concerns. Yeah. So but it's one of those things I want to revisit this, just turn all the lights off and turn on the fireplace and and go and listen to it in that environment with no distractions because it is so immersive and spooky. And, um, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. And it's, I had this strange experience. I did a radio play, uh, called bad memories, which was, I don't know, four or five years ago now, I guess. And that involves the Blake house incident. And it's about, uh, I'm not going to bore you with the pitch, but it's based on a bunch of found audio from a haunted house where a bunch of people have died. And I'm now turning it into a movie. And we figured out that actually the best way of doing it in the movie theater is not to transpose audio to video and do like a Blair Witch kind of thing is to keep audio audio and just to black out the lights in the theater when the audio happens so that everyone's sitting in the dark and you hear it and it will be, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting kind of communal experience to have that happen. Oh yeah. I think that'd be very effective. Well, it's kind of also like you think about, um, for instance, the, the Werner Herzog's grizzly man, and how yeah, the exactly exactly yeah that moment like you, there's a lot to be learned from the impact of the moment when you what you don't hear and seeing Absolute, someone yeah. react to it yeah it's just uh horror is such a great genre for that <laughs> yeah. uh it's just uh, it's an amazing genre for that because you're doing that hitchcock thing of playing the audience like an orchestra you know you're just scaring people and that's a really great thing if you can nail it um and logic goes out the window and rationality goes out of the window if it's frightening like you know when uh the kid giggles in uh, various parts of uh, the whisper in darkness mm-hmm. i know people it just it just freaks them out Yes, you know, I know that's my daughter watching a cat video. <laughs> <laughs> <No one else. laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah, it is. It is super eerie. Uh, and 
in a in a sea of 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 mediocre storytelling podcasts it's a real yeah. treat because this is like this is among if you're a bbc f fan of their long history of radio drama especially speculative fiction like um hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy lord of the rings lord of the rings and when they did the star wars adaptations and everything else you're uh -huh. it's just this is up there with all of that it's not like oh, thank you it doesn't have that disposable feeling that a lot of of agreed storytelling podcasts have yeah there's a lot it feels like to unpack in this too yeah. like that you do need to listen multiple times to really to pick up on all of it, which I love. Yeah. I mean, I grew up on the doctor who of the 1970s and eighties and the, you know, stuff like Quatermass and things. And I've always yeah. kind of, and Sapphire and steel. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Sapphire and steel, but it was amazing. Yeah. I think you can get it on um, YouTube over here. Yeah. It's uh yeah, it, it hasn't dated brilliantly, but it, they do sound really well in that because they did had no money for effects. So all of their scary stuff in Sapphire and Steel is done with sound. Um, but uh, I grew up on those and they kind of stamped themselves on me. They're really, really memorable because of the atmosphere of them. And that's kind of what I'm going for. It's like something that, like you say, isn't disposable. It's like, I want you to listen to it. You don't have to listen to it more than once, but I would like it if 10, 20 years down the line, you're like, oh, remember that show. That's what you're after. Right. And also you, it feels like it's going somewhere. And I know that you, mm -hmm. you, you are having fun kind of finding your story, but I also yeah. find that that's what sets this apart is I do feel like, um, your, it feels like your seasons are conceived, um, in entirety in a certain respect, like the arc is there, which there were yeah, great that's there, a lot more than anything. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> well, I've known other great, like there's been some great, uh, genre story podcast, drama podcasts that, that they didn't, they never thought, I guess they would be successful. Mm -hmm. And once they had run out of this brilliant story, they had set up, they had no end in sight to begin with. And it, they would kind of like Peter out, but I, I do still feel like you're amping up to something. So hopefully, uh, hopefully the muse will hit you really hard with your big. Well, I think the thing out. is I've, I've kind of gone, okay, this is going to be three seasons. So I know that the next season is the last one. Even if I do a Kennedy Haywood story after that, this storyline finishes in three seasons. So I kind of know what the goal is. And, but the problem is, as you guys know, with Lovecraft, it's such a kind of ethereal goal because you're like, what are we going to do? Arrest somebody at the end? Are we gonna <laughs> right. stop it? You know, it's like all, all you ever going to do is go, can they both get to the end of season three without going insane? And uh, can they get some kind of an answer that is satisfying on some basic level? Because Lovecraft kind of denies you that most of the time. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, um, it is existential dread. It's just like, hey, uh, yeah. everything's meaningless and uh, don't look too hard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think that kind of don't look too hard is actually, I think, where we're going to end up because I don't want to end the world. I don't want to have two podcast presenters who are gibbering wrecks in an asylum not making <laughs> sense to anyone. Um, so I think it's just uh, kind of put it back in its box ending ultimately you know yeah. which feels quite lovecraft to me of kind of going okay let's just pretend that didn't happen definitely and walk away now are there any i know we talked about how film and tv it's very difficult to translate lovecraft but do you have any that you feel like nailed it and did it right uh, oh god that's a good question I actually have a soft spot for the hp lovecraft historical society's movie of the whisperer in darkness which oh they yeah kind of 30s black and white style um it's not it doesn't work for me on the level of uh you know, the shining do you know what i mean it's not like right. you've gone to see a movie and it and it works on but but as a kind of uh curio and as a kind of homage piece it's really really nicely done and i love those guys audio dramas as well yeah they do a great um, job with all of that they stuff. do a really great job which is actually one of the reasons that i went in completely opposite direction because it's like there's no point in charles dexter ward straight they've done it and they did it well um so you know you have to kind of go in a different direction as for lovecraft i recently watched for the first time, uh, the John Carpenter movie in the mouth of madness. Oh, yeah. That's the one that always comes to mind for me. It's my favorite. Well, it's the most Lovecraft movie that he did really. I mean, well, it kind of is weirdly enough. I kind of think the thing is a super Lovecraft movie mm -hmm, as well. For but, sure. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, but that is the kind of the straight up kind of homage to Lovecraft. It doesn't entirely work, but the moments where it does, you're like, yeah, you nailed it. Right. Uh, and, and everything else that I can imagine feels unattainable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's not, it's weird. I haven't seen, have you guys seen the color out of space yet? The Nick Cage I'm movie? I'm so excited we, for it. I'm we, dying to see it. We, we have it. We're screening it, but we're not allowed to talk about it yet. Okay. <laughs> have you seen it? Okay. No, I haven't. And I'm kind of scared too, because like, I don't know how you do it. Right. And, uh, I really want them to have nailed it and I'm frightened they haven't. And I, 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 you know, who knows? I have no idea. Um, I would shy away from, I think, I think that this podcast was, was my perfect medium for Lovecraft because it allowed me to do the investigative aspect of Lovecraft, which I find really interesting. And that's the bit I felt like I could nail. Um, I don't know that like, I would not be the person that, uh, would volunteer to go make a, a two hour movie of the call of Cthulhu. Right. Um, because I'm not sure how you get that feeling onto the screen. That said, I was really up for Guillermo del Toro's, uh, mountains of madness. Oh yeah. It's a real shame about that, <laughs> which I would, yeah, that would have been amazing. He's going to keep teasing it. He's going to turn up at events and be like, guess what? Maybe. (laughs) (laughs) But I found, you know, there was, there were elements of Lovecraft and Crimson Peak. I thought there are certainly elements of Lovecraft, obviously in Hellboy and stuff. They're they're there. The DNA is there through so much stuff, but no one has really kind of out and out nailed a Lovecraft story straight up. Have they? I would agree with that. Yeah. I almost feel like it's going to require an advance in technology, like the Oculus Rift or virtual reality. Well, even it's that, going to mean something. Yeah, even that. This is why I was saying that that what you're doing is 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 really the perfect venue for it. Because again, what, when you see something, even even if they do an amazing job with effects or or you know with showing you just enough or not too much, there's still something I feel like where it, like what you're saying about passive um, entertainment, where you're you're still kind mm-hmm. of looking at it. Where I think the way it's being played out for you in audio you you're create like it's it's up to your level of of imagination to uh you know to decide what's going to scare you and um and i just but do you think that's do you think we think that because we're call of cthulhu players <laughs> like we've experienced you know what i mean though we've been we've been inside that world as kind of more or less participants do you know what i mean in a gaming sense we've participated right. in it in a way that we maybe haven't with other kind, like like no one's played a Stephen King role playing game, you know that you, you haven't done that, but you've been inside the Lovecraft world, you've done that investigation, you tried to figure out what the letters mean and stuff, and so that we kind of like okay, so that's the way to do Lovecraft. Whereas if you're, you know, if you're a Stephen King fan, that probably wouldn't occur to you to do Stephen King as an investigative podcast because that's movies is where that stuff lives. Right. No, that's a good point. Yeah, it's for us. I think it is so much about the feeling and and being surrounded, um, whereas maybe not everybody needs that. Right. No, I mean, but at the same time, I do think that the dread is. I think. I think you know, jump scares are easy to do. I think gore is easy to do, and not necessarily well, but they're all. You know, we know how to, we know what that looks like. Existential dread. I don't know. I mean, like, I think Lost Highway had existential dread. I think yeah. that Lynch's third season of Twin Peaks was, you know, I like. I would like to think Lovecraft would have liked that. I, I mean, I'm sure he wouldn't have done because he was, you know, difficult and mad. <laughs> Prickly, <you know>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I feel like you wouldn't get the third season of Twin Peaks without Lovecraft. Right. And that felt like it had existential dread in it, and, and Lost Highway did, and Mulholland Drive did as well. You know, I think maybe Lynch is the guy doing existential dread better than anyone else. Man, yeah, I think you're right. I actually think uh, Ari Aster uh, is, yes. is, is doing some uh, hereditary uh, feels uh, like it's definitely got a lot of uh, Lovecraft it in does, it. It does, but hereditary for me felt like there were a lot of boxes being ticked. Like going through that movie, I was like, oh, it's that bit, and then it's that bit, and then it's that bit. And it wasn't until we got to the end. Uh, where I was kind of like, oh, that's the movie you were making. I kind of want to see more of that movie. Right. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's a weird 60s kind of almost like a Wicker Man movie lurking mm-hmm. in here. And I didn't know that's where we were going until it was too late. Right. Yeah. And it, it, there is like, 
the horror in general like as we glut our we just gorge on it we actually try to even control the amount of like we we randomly assign people to different projects just so people don't burn out and like you know and it's kind of like uh to bring this one the wonder is an element i think that is missing from most contemporary horror that element of Yes, horror is meant to like uh, give you this reaction, this very like core like id thing, but the, also that whole wonder thing, the the wonder that draws you into the danger to begin with, mm -hmm. is sometimes like missing from from these stories and these movies, where you you don't leave feeling like, hey, I, I kind of want to know more of why that happened, um, but maybe I don't. I'm too scared to, to look into it. This is why I think Ghostbusters yeah, yeah. is the best Lovecraft movie that's not a Lovecraft movie. <laughs> yeah. I that's like, interesting. Yeah. I, I feel like Ghostbusters kind of nails it in a way that that's not necessarily uh, uh, super in your face. But uh, when, when you put it all together, it's 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 pretty Lovecraft. Yeah. It's like hiding vitamins yeah, in oatmeal or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's true. That's true yeah uh gozer and <laughs> all that it does feel like a lovecraft thing so much well the whole uh, the whole uh uh vince clortho talking about the 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 rectification of all drawn eye and <laughs> yeah <laughs> all the esoteric and the weird names and yeah i'm sure they drew from that yeah, it is it and, is and obviously Ackroyd, you know he buys it all this stuff like i mean his family even like they this was a, something that was just a reality to a lot of them uh, which again goes back to that finding the Necronomicon in the bookstore, you know, pre-internet <laughs> yeah. wonderment. Yeah. Uh, this is so much fun. I could talk to you all night, Julian, <laughs> but I know you have a life to get to. Um, so I, I want to tell everybody here, we, I get your show through Apple podcasts, um, yeah. but you can also go to the BBC's website. Uh, correct. Like they have ever all the radio shows. I think there. So I don't know how it, I'm going out to LA in uh, January. I'm going to check it out. Cause I don't know how it works out there. I don't know. Uh, I think everyone I know in America is listening is listening via Apple or you know, whatever podcast app they use. But, uh, I, cause I don't know what the BBC's kind of weird border thing is. I don't know. Like, I don't think you can get the BBC sounds app, in uh the us yet but you can probably get it through the website but i don't know if you can download it from the website it's a whole thing um so apple podcast definitely you can get it yeah and also um when you pull this up you the the seasons make sure you start with charles dexter ward before you start yeah. whispering Dark. and it's kind of when you, we pull it up it, you're you might be a little confused in the the apple podcast format just go back you know if you sort things by date you can find the first episode uh just fantastic uh i'd love to have you on again in the future if you ever want to you ever want to spend Definitely. time talking about lovecraft again. absolutely yeah, <laughs> or yeah, anything yeah. anything else yeah yeah this is well, so much I can fun do a horror movie hopefully uh soon with the bad memories that i was talking about and we've got season three of uh of this show um and then some tv stuff that's probably relevant to you guys as well so yeah absolutely let's come back yeah excellent yeah great. hit us up with uh, whatever you got we'll we'll be glad to talk about it awesome thanks again Julian Simpson, the Thank creator. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks. Man.